the inaugural event of what we hope will become a very lively series of discussions. And our aim, our aim, we in this context is former MEPs. And our aim is to try and get some proper in-depth discussion of problems in society and to try and get some free thinking about what can be done to try and combat them and what is being done and, and what, I just want to bring good minds together to talk about um, potential solutions to uh, society's ills, if you like. That sounds very depressing, but you know what I mean. The debate today is a truthful press and media, misinformation, disinformation, and truthful hyperbole. Um, one other uh, subtitle that was suggested, and it does seem slightly appropriate in connection with the treatment of Nick Watts in recent days, is um, facts in a time of feeling. You may want to think in those terms as well. So the discussion is split into three sections. You all should have a programme. Here in the room, we also have photos of people so that you can identify who's speaking. Um, I'm, yes, you don't have those in Zoom land. I would ask that everybody who speaks identifies themselves every time. Um, there isn't time for a great long introduction about yourselves, you know, 20 people, that would take half the meeting. But if you can say your name and um, what your allegiance is, then that would be very helpful to everyone. What we're looking for, the third topic, is where we are looking for practical solutions to these problems. We actually are trying to think, what is it that society, that publishers, that journalists, and that policymakers could do to actually make, um, to improve matters? And whose responsibility really is it to act? Being a round table, everybody will have a, an opportunity to speak on every topic. Lead named people for each topic, which is on your programme, which you should have received by email. You also got a, a cheap version on your seat. Um, named people on each topic get up to five minutes. I'm going to be a little bit strict about this, so you will be warned and then you will be asked to stop. Um, everybody else gets a minute. And this is European Parliament rules. Um, in European parliamentary debates, you get a minute. My advice to you is start with the good stuff because it's all too easy to start with a slow beginning and then you get cut off just before you get to the um, important part that you really want to share. So um, we're aiming at a minute for all other contributions. And I believe that's all of my housekeeping. The next person to speak is Lucy Netzinger, who is the former chair of the Legal Affairs Committee in the European Parliament. And Lucy is going to tell us why um, she felt particularly that this should be the topic we discussed today. Wonderful. Is this why that, discuss it? Uh, that's Maybe a good question. It, it worked know? earlier? No, nobody can hear us. Oh, God, sorry, sorry, Lucy. I'm wondering if I can just borrow yours. Uh, <laughs> that's too difficult because it pops apart. These should work yeah. fine. Sorry. It will get easier, guys. Um, can anybody hear this? Can you hear the speaker? No. No. Okay. Still, no, still nothing. Still let nothing. Me look, let me have a look. It sounds as though her mic isn't working. We can hear her through your mic, maybe very distantly. Yes, but these should be working. Is this one any better? Can you hear me now? No, no I think it's actually switched off. That is the. Um... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let's. Uh, Forgive me, I'd like to get these working for the, um, I know, uh, Isabel's gone. Okay, Lucy, you use this. It's not going to be practical for the rest of the meeting. But for now. Thank you. Can you hear me now? That sounds much better. Okay, I'm, I'm going to be quite brief because we are starting quite late and there's a lot to discuss and I have another slot later on so I can say a bit more. Um, I, um, just to introduce myself, I was the MEP for uh, the East of England. Um, I am now the leader of Cambridgeshire County Council. Um, these um, issues, I, I got particularly interested in this um, topic 
when I became the chair of the jury committee at um, the European Parliament, who have responsibility for um, regulation and copyright um, civil ma law matters. Um, so copyright was something that we were discussing a lot. Um, and I also got lobbied by Nick Clegg, so I thought I'd better go and do some reading. Um, when I was doing this reading, I came across um, this amazing, I, don't, I can't hold it up, but there's a really, really impressive um, European Commission um, uh, topic, um, which, which is called Understanding Our Political Nature. And the first chapter of this talks a lot about how much more difficult it is to change somebody's mind if they are misinformed than if they are uninformed. And that if you have misinformation, if you have information which is incorrect, it is then that very, very much more difficult to change somebody's view on something than if they know that they know nothing. Um, and, and the position that we're in at the moment with a, an enormous quantity of misinformation out there in, on the internet means that it's actually much more difficult to then persuade people of accurate information because they believe that they are informed. Um, and, and that's that's sort of where I started getting interested in this. As a British MEP, clearly misinformation was quite high on my agenda. Given what we've had since then with the COVID pandemic, and now as somebody who has significant responsibility for public health, um, and uh, at, at the moment we have issues with vaccine uptake in my area, um, misinformation becomes even more important. So this is not a topic which has become less important. And I think it's something that we need to, to really focus on. And it comes from so many different directions. It's a really, really complex, knotty issue to try and resolve. So I'm not expecting we're going to be able to resolve it in these discussions, but I do think it's a really important thing that we should be talking about. Um, I think that's enough for me at this point, because I get to come back later. Um, shall I hand this back to you? So the first speaker on this topic is Martina, uh, and I did practice this, Bills Jukovic. She is a little delayed and has asked to be moved to the end of that uh, list. So Nick, are you happy to pick up now? You have up to five minutes to tell us your thoughts and your experiences. Okay, maybe I should start by trying to describe the origins of the problem. So number one, obviously, is, is social media operating as an information sewer, spreading falsehood on a scale and at a speed that has never been possible before in human history. Okay, we could take that as a given. The more interesting area to look at is mainstream media and its contribution to the distribution of falsehood and distortion. The first thing to understand there is that because the internet has broken the model of almost all news organizations in the developed world, Journalism is no longer capable of performing its function properly. It doesn't have the resources to go out and find the stories itself and check the truth of what they're picking up, which is a really, really important structural problem. If, if you take that and put it in the background as a very important fact, look at how it combines with the growth of an industry which really scarcely existed when I became a reporter in the mid 1970s. This is the public relations industry. It sounds like a perfectly innocent thing, but in the context of mainstream news organizations not, in, not being able to perform their function, the result is we've reached a point which would have been unthinkable in the 50s, 60s and 70s, that governments, corporations, trade unions, celebrities, are able to decide over and over again what the supposedly free press says about them. This doesn't necessarily involve lies. Sometimes it does. If you could quantify the proportion of PR activity which is actually false, it would probably be 5%. It's relatively rare, but it's important. What's much more important is they get to decide what truths we tell about them. They manage the news, they manipulate. And more and more news organizations simply passively recycle what those powerful people have decided we should say about them. And, and that you could categorize as distortion. So like, just to give you a concrete example, if you were the press officer for, uh, for the Metropolitan Police and you come in in the morning and on the log it says that the assistant commissioner, no names here and entirely fictional, last night happened to be so drunk that he had to be taken home in a car and put to bed. But also on the log, it says that a young officer 
is getting a medal uh, this morning because they rescued a baby from a burning building. Well, you as the press officer have to decide which story to put out. You've got two seconds. It isn't a difficult choice. You know what they're going to put out. And the press will recycle that. Because of their weakness, they won't even know about the drunken assistant commissioner, let alone have the time to check it and put it into print. Alongside the PR industry, there is propaganda. This is military and intelligence agencies who fabricate entirely false stories in order to achieve a diplomatic, political or military end. And that too is being fed into these passive mainstream news organizations who are not capable of discerning truth from falsehood. That's a slight overstatement of the case, but that's the trend. So that if you stand back and look at it, I mean, the other point also is that where we started with social media, they too feed into mainstream media so that PR, propagandists, and lunatics and malevolent players, including foreign intelligence agencies, can use social media to inject falsehood and distortion into mainstream media. So it's quite a complicated structure and it won't be dealt with by any kind of simplistic maneuver. It needs a really clever, I suppose you'd say multifaceted approach to try and unpick it and get us back to a world in which the truth has some kind of primacy. Thank you. Thank, you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, sorry, Nick. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm now going to call on Evan. Evan Harris. Welcome. Sorry, didn't get to say hello before, but you have up to five minutes to tell us of your experiences and your thoughts on this topic. These are now working. Okay, thank you, Irina. You can stand up and pace if you wish. Or can, you I can, be, can I be seen by the... You can be seen. Well, I'm happy to move somewhere where I can't. I can't see, Evan. I'm very disappointed. Actually, no, you're too close to the screen. If you'd Shall like I? to walk walk up this end. Come, come, it's, not, come. it's not often we have a real celebrity. I'd like, <laughs> I'd like to be as far distant as possible, so if you can I wave can in the distance. Uh, yes, so I come to this... Uh, I'm, I'm a former executive director of Hacked Off. I was a parliamentarian for many years where I was particularly interested in uh, from a human rights perspective in freedom of expression uh, and um, but pretty but during the my last few years up to 2010 I noticed the other side of the um, article 10 article 8 divide which was the intrusion that was clearly taking place which which Nick Davis had written about and I was just uh, searching I searched on the first mention of of Nick Davis's breakthrough 2009 article in July in July 2009 in the House of Commons and it was me I raised it in Parliament uh, and I don't remember having done that even though I then spent the last next 10 years of my life uh, relying on his research um, so when I left Parliament I became involved in the hacked off campaign which was designed to find a way of ensuring that there was independent press regulation which protected investigative journalism and freedom of expression but also um, try to ensure that the rights of individuals, especially those without the recourse to law, that is people without um, expensive or even cheap lawyers, if such things exist, uh, uh, that, that, um, that, those, that the rights of individuals were protected and that we could improve the, the truth telling, or if not the truth telling, the correction setting of the press in particular. So I specialized in the press. And uh, is it a deficit that I look to this only in terms of the press and not broadcast? Not really in this country, because broadcast is, is independently regulated. So there is a mechanism, whatever the criticisms there are of broadcast and with new entrants into the field, I think there will be more complaints. There is somewhere to go that is reasonably independent uh, and accessible, at least in terms of dealing with accuracy and distortion and under UK law, uh, the need for a balanced output. Uh, and indeed, when you look at the Martin Bashir business, you have an organization that actually did an independent investigation led by a judge uh, that was highly critical and then broadcast it on its quotes front page on its main mainstream programs. Um, if you contrast that with the press, there is no independent regulation. Uh, they're opposed 
They're in favor of judge-led independent inquiries except into them when they are against it and they work corruptly with politicians to, to uh, work against casting sunlight on what they've done. And, uh, and they uh, would never publish and you can see this with the recent Daniel Morgan panel report, any element that's critical of them, they won't publish. So there is a, so I object to the use of the term media, well, British media in particular, my area, when considering these things, because there's a huge difference between the broadcast media and the press. And then you ask the question, well, where does social media fit in? Now, social media is full of distortion. It's full of um, uh, hate speech. It's full of uh, uh, misinformation. But polls show, surveys show, proper across international surveys show that it is not as trusted as uh, broadcasters in particular, and generally isn't as trusted uh, as things that have editors. Okay? So obviously, present company accepted, but a lot of people don't control exercise much editorial control on their social media, naming no names, um, uh, but, uh, but they don't pause to think. Whereas by definition, when you have a, a journal, a newspaper, which says it has a high editorial standard, someone is casting a view and that's why they say you can trust them. And although if you look at surveys of trust in, uh, in the media in Britain, tabloid newspapers come out very badly, barely above the random musings of, of people on, on their social media feeds, among the readers of those newspapers, it's much higher. So it's other, so you do have a problem that what comes out of these unregulated, um, still in certain cases, cesspits of misinformation, distortion, and intrusion is believed by the, that by that group. So if there is a problem of echo chamberism, which there is in social media, it also applies to the press, but that's not talked about, especially by the press. They talk about the problem of online media because obviously it impacts on their, on their business model. Um, so we have proposals in the online, uh, in the online uh, hate legislation to regulate social media uh, to bring it in some way, your and my Twitter feed, if you like. But the exception will be uh, newspapers. If they can pretend to be regulated as they are by their non-regulator poodle, uh, Ipso, then they will, not be, they will not be subject to any regulation. So you'll have media, you'll have uh, the newspapers unregulated, and then you'll have increasing regulation of social media, which is not without free speech implications. So that is the background against which we're working. And the problem in the room is often the one that's ignored and ignored by itself. Okay, thank you very much, Evan. That's very good. And Marie. Um, ooh. Yes. Right, am I, am I in vision? No. No, I'm gonna have to hang on. No, hold on. I can do something about that. Whoop. There you are. There you are. There we go. Brilliant. Um, so my name's Marie Henley. I um, lead on a world service project called Beyond Fake News. Um, and I just before I, I start on that, I just you know I um, Evan mentioned uh, the Martin Bashir case, and it is so relevant because. I have to say, I'm not going to go into it, but I have to, all our colleagues are heartbroken and we're heartbroken because we really understand that the only thing we can trade in is trust. And if our trust is broken, then there is no meaning to the BBC and there's no meaning to what we do. And so although we have many programs and fact checking and reality checking and, you know, many interesting programs, none of it means anything unless people trust, trust us, trust what we say and trust who we are. So this kind of thing is very damaging for us and we're very well aware of it. And although it's, you know, it's lovely to say, of course we put it on our front pages and we, we um, interrogate where we can ourselves, it's, it doesn't undo the damage of those headlines. So, so we are aware. Um, in terms of what we do specifically, so I don't think it's a coincidence that the programme 
that has been driving uh, um, our anti-misinformation content has come from the World Service. In 2018, we decided that we needed to do more than just create trusted news stories. We put our journalism out there and the people will come. And actually, see, that's very recent, isn't it? That most, people, most journalists in the BBC would have thought, we don't need to tackle this. We don't, this isn't something for us. People were very resistant to kind of getting engaged in this because we put our journalism out there and people find us and we don't really want to try and get involved in telling people probably, you know, what did they think? What should they think? Um, however, we realized that although there was a problem in English and people understood, you know, increasingly understood things about bot factories and bad actors and Russians and the American elections, all these things were sort of circling around, you know, quite freely by 2018. In the UK, people still didn't really think this was something about us. I mean, that's kind of amazing, isn't it? Only three years ago. Um, and it was about Americans and it was about Russians and it was about being aware of bots. Um, but what we were aware of was in, because we have 42 languages, that there was incredible bit harm being done um, on the ground. That in India, there was a whole spate of murderous mobs where people were sharing content on social media about, you know, it's a classic stranger danger. I mean, it's not unique, but it was leading, you know, to, I think there was about 30 deaths over a couple of months. It was shocking numbers. Um, and it was because people suddenly had cheap smartphones, very cheap smartphones with free data as long as it had Facebook. Um, and the news was Facebook and people didn't really understand, especially in these rural areas where things were happening, you know, in appalling ways that you know the internet wasn't as the social media provider that they had and so beyond fake news which is my project kind of grew from that which was how do we reach out to people who don't really understand uh, who are not media literate you know even more so than here um, and who don't really even understand the internet and who suddenly are, have this data so a lot of the work we're doing around the world is trying to reach out and kind of encourage that kind of critical thinking and understanding is kind of integrated into the journalism that we do. So there's a lot of training going on for our journalists, you know, especially across India and Africa about how do you, how do you share anti-vax messages without amplifying headlines? We know people just read headlines now, that's a huge problem for us. How do you get people to read the, the small print? Reality Check is our biggest brand, a fact-checking brand, but really there is a problem there in that it just kind of super serves the, the, the you know, the, the elites in, certainly in the UK and, and beyond, you know, to read the nuances and grey areas of a, of a BBC Reality Check, you're pretty engaged, you're not, you know, this, it's not going to change the hearts and minds of, of our wider audiences. So I'd say the journey we've had in the last three years, really thinking about the UK and globally is how do we reach those people who, um, who are sharing conspiracy theories? I mean, COVID has been an astonishing moment for us, hasn't it? I mean, for the BBC, I have to say it's, you know, in some ways it's been, you know, it's been good for business. I mean, our, our numbers globally are worth up times five, you know, incredible numbers, people asking simple questions like, you know, um, what is COVID? How can I not not um, how do I avoid it? Um, you know, asking us questions, really simple questions. And so I think the road we're on is we still want to do the high impact, you know, investigative stuff, but we want to reach out to people who, who um, are getting anti-vax messages or who will be having, seconds. who are having their um, rights as citizens undermined with harmful information. And we're not there yet. This is this is where we are. We're investing in it, but we we are certainly haven't got any answers yet. But that's where we are at the moment. Thank you, thank you, Marie. Um, Martina from the um, European External Action Service hasn't arrived yet. She is still coming, so we will move on and incorporate her as she arrives. Which means, would you like to raise hands, or shall we just go round the room in order? Round the room in order. Okay, you're too slow. So we'll start with Catherine over here. If you would. So Catherine Bearder, former MEP. Hello. For yes, um, Catherine Bearder, um, former MEP, um, a leader of the, of the group, uh, leader of my own group when I was uh, there on my own. And then I was joined by these 60 wonderful um, MEPs. Uh, when we stood 
on a ticket of stop Brexit, uh, a clear, simple message uh, that resonated with the public. Half, half the country uh, voted for us, half the other wanted to leave. And I think we're still uh, not much different from that. Um, I, I find, um, uh, Marie, your, your comments about the cheap phones and the easy uh, headlines that are spreading fear uh, around the world, quite interesting. And it, uh, I always go to the World Service when I want, the, the, especially when I was traveling around, to get the clear picture of what was going on, even more so than, than the UK news. Um, but uh, I, I don't know how we get over that. I, uh, historically, I think we've got over that when the printing press was uh, printed and uh, things were going up on walls, they, they had to bring in late legislation. But actually what saved people was education. Um, and we haven't really got time for, for that because we know that we're talking about um, people around the world who have no access to education, but they do have access to this misinformation or disinformation. Um, 10 seconds. Okay, uh, so really, uh, I, I find that as a real challenge uh, to us, and I don't know whether that's a question or or, or, um, uh, or not, but it, it, to me, it's it's one of the most worrying things because fear um, fear spreads an awful lot quicker than, than the truth and, and um, uh, good news. Thank you, thank you. I'm being a bit more generous with time because we've done quite well so far, but don't go over the top, Phil. Um, <laughs> Okay, Phil. <laughs> Probably question to Evan if he's still with us. Yes, uh, he was very concentrating on his iPad there. Um, the uh, the tabloid press. Um, uh, how how much of the problem is due to ownership? Um, obviously, a lot of uh, a lot of the press is owned by individuals who are extremely wealthy and have particular interests. Uh, they have their own interests and uh, there's some doubt about sort of editorial freedom, I think, in some of these organs. But, um, for instance, if Shorosh or Gates were the owners of these uh, organs, would, would it actually improve things if we had uh, other tabloid newspapers that were looking from a more liberal direction? Or is actually the, 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 uh, the real... Um, uh, is it inimical towards these organs that they actually need this sort of shock jock type uh, journalism, which uh, which doesn't lend itself to uh, to to the more liberal views? Um, you know, there are there are forms of entertainment. Is it actually very, just too difficult um, to produce uh, that sort of material um, in a in a, a with a more liberal perspective? Um, or, or do you think it could be done and is simply a, um, uh, an issue of ownership? Uh, so that's my main question. Uh, okay, I also note seconds. that nobody's mentioned trolling. Uh, now, I've been very lucky with my trolls. I've only got two of them, and I know both of them actually very well, uh, whereas most trolls, I think, are unknown to people. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Phil. And now, uh, Richard, this is Richard Allen, Lord Richard Allen, from the European Digital Media Observatory. <laughs> Thanks very much. And um, I've been working on uh, tech policy issues uh, probably for about 20 years in different capacities on the political <laughs> side, but also probably importantly for this discussion, I spent 10 years working at Facebook, so I kind of know from that side. Yeah. And just the observation at this, this stage is that um, uh, people tend to see the problem through their own lens. It's really hard to get a common definition of what the problem is because we all see it through our own lenses and the same kind of activity we can feel very differently about depending on where we sit. Just to pick a very specific example for this section, uh, um, we talked earlier about India, Marie talked about India. You know, the Indian government may come and say there is a problem with dangerous misinformation circulating on social media that is leading to disorder and death. And in that case, it may well be that it's somebody is stimulating kind of interreligious conflict and it is dangerous and probably we would all agree something should be done about it. The Russian government will come and use exactly the same language about content being distributed by Alexei Navalny, dangerous extremist content and, and misinformation should be removed. So just as a very specific example, you, you get these differences, the, the same behavior is seen very differently depending on where we all sit politically and we need to understand that. And then within a democracy, what one regards as, as dangerous or inappropriate misinformation, again, will depend on who's putting it out. So it's no coincidence that 
the big uh, sort of drive around this came as a reaction to uh, Trump and Brexit victories. Um, had those elections, it felt like had those elections gone the other way, we would have been having a very different debate. So just to say that we need to recognize what we bring to the table when we talk about this problem, and there isn't a common definition. There's a million definitions depending on where you sit. Thank you. So now Richard Reeves, who is the CEO of the Association of Online Publishers. Yes, um, which is a, a trade body that represents the interests of the creators of quality original online content. Um, I'm, I'm sort of going to dip to some notes because we recently ran an event in March on this topic ourselves. And, and I think we can see that journalism is, is under tighter scrutiny than ever. And this development isn't just natural, it, it is necessary. But I want to frame some of what's been said here before me. And obviously later I'm talking to some of the solution. Um, you know, we still find challenges um, with ensuring true stories are heard and earning confidence. But an online frag, um, as online fragmentation creates an overwhelming chorus of voices, it's becoming increasingly difficult for readers to distinguish those credible sources mm -hmm. to recognize that. Um, we um, invited Reuters Institute to our event who talked to some statistics, which I think uh, um, Nick touched on earlier, but the last few years, years have brought an increasing decline of media trust, especially in the news. And according to the Reuters Institute, faith has fallen from 51% to just 28% in, in 2020. Largely the result of two core factors, he suggests, evolving consumer attitudes and habits. Um, a series of polarizing situations have seen passions run high and deeper divisions drawn, which leads to skepticism of journalism that individuals don't believe, and this is the key point here, represents their viewpoint. Uh, these issues obviously aren't helped by the growth of social media usage, um, and citing um, findings, this is Reuters again, that almost one in three consumers discover news via social media. Ten seconds. Um, automated news for cu curation now means each person is presented, if you like, with the version of their own reality, um, which um, it, it's just constantly reflecting existing opinion. Um, we do lead the way here in the UK for the charge of holding social platforms to greater account and legislation. Equally, um, there is a need for the industry to, to understand to and accommodate what today's audiences uh, see on digital media. I'll thank you. Right. Thank you, Richard. Very good. <clears throat> thank you for stopping. OK, I'd like, now like to go to um, Carrie. Carrie Kivenen on Zoom. Are you happy and prepared for your, your comments? Uh, could you unmute? I have to ask you. Yep. Now I'm on mute. I'm representing here um, education and the Finnish education and fact checking. I've been working for that for the past years. And uh, I have a little bit different approach than all of you, um, especially that we cannot do anything. We can do something. We are all facing a new. Uh, reality online world which is different than offline world and we have not yet created enough skills and competencies to deal with this online world with online i mean anybody can say something and it's spread in seconds to millions this is not happening in the offline world um, the, the problem on uh, information management is also same in the good old times we went to library we found a book, what we're looking for, encyclopedias. Now, when we go Google, we get millions of hits. And it's up to us individual citizens to try to find out which of the information out of the millions of hits is correct. And unfortunately, big platforms are also kind of disturbing the research results. They are giving priorities for paid uh, using technologies. Um, and we don't know how it works. It's not transparent. So we are kind of um, dealing with new online environment where the rules are still non-existing. And this is something, the only thing I'm going to propose as a, as a solution this afternoon is developing a critical thinking starting from early education. And in Finland, we are quite far on, on that. And I will share my, my findings and our approach later on today. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. 
And then if we could go to uh, Shafak, Shafak Mohammed. Are you with us still, Shafak? Oh, Shafak's disappeared. Okay, and uh, Nick, you've had a go. Uh, so Alexandra, would you like to take the floor? And um, could you unmute? Lovely. Yes, yes. Hello, uh, thank you once again, Jody, for organizing it and uh, for having me. I, I miss you truly in Brussels. <laughs> it's a very timely debate. I come from Poland, Jody knows that. In Poland, we have the problem of disinformation, fake news and state-owned uh, broadcasters that are introducing this true censorship. So for us, it is a bigger problem, I think, than for most of the countries on the European continent. However, for this information, I think this information is much more grave and dangerous than fake news because fake news we can quickly dismiss. Uh, we have plenty of websites uh, that and people engage uh, who are um, tracing fake news and they can be very quickly proven wrong. However, this information and exaggerating the importance of the real context, giving new meanings and omitting the context may, may, may mislead the recipient and lead to radicalization of attitudes. I can give you a very silly example from the Polish press that I saw last uh, weekend, uh, well, last week actually, during the Roland Garros uh, French Open tournament. There was a headline on the Polish newspaper saying, Andy Murray, your tennis player, is in love with Polish tennis player, but he just tweeted that I love the way she plays. But the media said it just to catch, mm -hmm. eye, to catch the eye, said Andy Murray claims he's in love with, with Iga Świątek. So this kind of tricks are really, really dangerous and it's growing problem. What I was looking now, what the EU is doing, and I found also one project organized by the Polish Geremek Foundation. Um, Geremek was a Polish uh, liberal Democrat, but uh, uh, like 10 years ago, and then unfortunately he passed away, but he has very famous Geremek Foundation in Poland, and they have a um, project called Keyboard Warriors. So this is an organization of civil society people who try to correct the language used in Polish media. I will share the links with Judith, maybe it will be of use for you to see, because I just learned that the project uh, got some awards from European Union and it's growing in popularity. So my takeoff would be that this information is much, 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 much greater than fake news, especially, you know, on European and Polish context. And the civil society has to organize itself. And of course, education is key. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, then we still would lost Shafak completely. If one of my MEP colleagues could text him and ask Shafak where he is, um, then we could fit him in at the end. And then we move, come back into the room and I will move to Irina. Thank you very much, Judith, and, and welcome everyone. Um, I was um, MEP for London and I'm currently on the Liberal Democrat work, Policy Working Group um, uh, entitled Nature of Public Debate, where we discuss similar topics. And I also worked as a lawyer in the ICT industry for many years. And um, I can really only um, second what Kerry has pointed out in terms of the um, necessity of, of education, because we, we were looking not just as, as disinformation, but also electoral manipulation, um, which of course is, is related, bots, etc. And um, at, at all of the technical means, fact checking, etc. But ultimately, um, I think what it boils down to is um, education early, uh, in starting in primary schools, uh, <laughs> literacy, and the ability to look at um, the, the motivation behind um, information and also the differentiation between facts and opinion which I hope we will talk about when we have our third topic um, in terms of remedies. Um, but this really is, is my comment for, the, um, for this very interesting first part of the discussion. So thank you, and I pass the mic. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yes, on to Stephanie. Stephanie, who is the London correspondent for Die Welt. Is that, is that working? Yeah. Um, I, can I also just ask a question? And I don't yes, want to of comment, course. Actually, um, Evan, could you um, elaborate a bit on what you said about that there's far more scrutiny on the broadcasters than the press? I didn't quite understand the argument you make. Is that the legal reason or it's simply the Murdoch power? Thank you. 
Well, there's a statutory regulator of the broadcast media in this country. So by statute, anyone with a broadcasting license is, re is regulated. And part of that regulation is not only accuracy, but there has to be a, a non-bias overall in the output. It'll be interesting to see how GB News manages to get away with that. But that's why Fox closed up in this country, because they knew they couldn't sustain that. Uh, they pretended it was another reason, but that was the reason, I think. So, uh, so that's the reason. I've got an answer for Phil, but I'll wait to my turn. But, but there is a difference. There is statutory regulation, Ofcom. And in, in Germany, we have something, it's called the Presserat. So that's an independent council, Presserat it's called. So mm -hmm. the Zeitung or any other newspaper has a headline that's completely untrue. They have to, the Presserat will come and, and, and force them to put a, a correction on their front page or whatever. Does that not exist here? No, for a long time, we've had a self-regulator, which doesn't mm -hmm. regulate, it's a complaints handler. And it has a rule that as long as the article in paragraph 19 makes clear what the headline should have said, it's okay. And even when that doesn't happen, they don't require same size corrections. So a fraction of the people who are misled by the original story or headline see it. And that's, that's the mainstream press who choose to be regulated in that way. There is a, an official sensible regulator, but it's only regulating because there's no compulsion despite recommendation of the Leveson inquiry, it's only regulating small journals and the Guardian lost the nerve and is standing on its own with the independent and okay. not part of the poodle, but also not part of the, the effective regulator. Thank you. So I'm, I've got to stop you the there, Richard, code, because yes. they can't hear on Zoom mm -hmm. unless you have the microphone. So um, uh, I'm going to move on to Lucy now, who gets her comment because you started, you're happy? That was a separate start. Okay, now do any of our original speakers, we're doing quite well for times, so if, if uh, Marie or Evan or Nick would like to um, pick up a minute, or indeed Richard, would you like to have a microphone for a moment? Because Martina is yeah. still trying to join us, but they have connection problems. So um, we, can, yeah, we, we can make space for her. Yeah. Um... I do know. I'm. I'm just going back because um, there was something else that I, I. I sort of wanted to touch on, but I think um, it was one thing at this event um, that we had, where a particular uh, journalist um, talked to a point, saying essential to winning back audience trust is recognizing that perceptions of truth are often highly varied, and I think this has been taught to. <laughs> Broadly, journalism follows a rigid definition of truthful and high quality content, well written research corroborate, corroborated and, uh, and fact-checked. But audience concepts are more nuanced. And I think this is a recognition for a lot of journalists at the moment. With reader interpretations, depending on unique beliefs, their verdict on quality is subjective. In other words, a lot of people um, will reject media if it's not telling them what they want to hear. And I think that is also one of the main challenges that we have. Um, but again, I'll talk more to the solutions um, as, as okay. we move forward. Thank you. I, and Nick, you take your minute now. That's uh, sorry, Nick. I disagree profoundly with what's just been said. So on the one hand, yes, we need to remind people of the skills of critical thinking, as our Finnish friend was saying. Education is incredibly important to get people back to the basics about understanding the difference between truth and falsehood. But what is really misleading and dangerous nonsense is to present contemporary journalism as a source of fact-checked, corroborated truth. Mainstream media is a significant part of the problem. And if you think of the problem simply as being lunatic anti-vaxxers, you're missing the big picture. We're, we've left the European Union on a tide of falsehood most of which was generated by the mainstream media and recycled over and over again. Never mind what happened on January the 6th in Capitol Hill. That, that's crazy people. Look at what happened in the, in the November election when Donald Trump won 8 million more votes than he had in November 2016. A lot of that is to do with mainstream media failing to do its job. So, Yes, let's look at the recipients of falsehood and try to educate them, but you have to look at the sources, and it isn't just nutcases on social media. 
And if, if, with mainstream media, two things have to happen. First, in an ideal world, we have to start taxing those huge digital organizations, skimming their profits and putting it back into the mainstream media so that they can recruit people and train people and get back to what they should be doing with fact checking. And secondly, which is Evan's strong point, we need a decent independent regulator so that when newspapers, and it's not just tabloids, the quality press are highly unreliable in this country. Don't imagine that the exactly. Times or the Guardian are sourced. So we need the regulation and we need the funding to get the mainstream media back to doing its job. Thank you. Marie, would you like to have uh, an additional comment at the end? Yeah, I, I think um, everyone's touched a nerve here. Sorry, I'm booming, aren't I? Yeah, <laughs> everyone's, everyone's touched a nerve here about um, people wanting to hear what they want to hear. And so obviously um, Nick is correct that, you know, the whole kind of manipulation of, of, of who's saying what is, is very, very difficult. But, but it's can we turn back the clock and people, you know, uh, sort of embracing what we might think of as old fashioned impartial journalism. Um, and so there are certain sort of things that we're thinking about where we are trying to say, well, here are the five facts you need to know, because you want to try and tap into that, that the kind of zeitgeist at the moment of, of opinion journalism. How do you kind of hold, grab that? but give it that kind of a, the bit of attitude and the kind of feeling of the moment where it's, you are saying, here's, here's what you really need to know about, I don't know, Trump or, or QAnon or, or education, but, but you give it in that kind of, you've got to kind of give it in that way. You've kind of got to modernize the way you say things. The whole language and discourse has got to kind of figure a way around this kind of opinion versus fact journalism, which I think is really at the heart of the problem because we just don't know how to pull the audiences back. You know, that, that is a big challenge for us. Thank you. Um, and I Lucy is to going to, oh yes, sorry, Evan. I just wanted to reply to, can I first say yes, that whatever the minute. problems, and I was conscious of the fact that my area of expertise is the UK, whatever the problems, and Phil identifies one with right-wing press ownership, a bigger problem is what we see in Hungary and Poland with authoritarian governments controlling much of the media. And I, let's just get some perspective. That's important to note. Having said that, Phil asks an important question. Uh, could we have you know, tabloids of the left that were equally effective? And, and I think, and I don't think you can. And we, if you, I've spent a long time now looking at what's happening in the US. The MSNBC is not an equivalent of Fox. They can't bring themselves to be that false for the left, as it were, and, and, and they don't get the viewership. Fox is still outstripping them because of their opinion journalism, quasi-news, quasi-opinion journalism. So I think it is a unique factor of the authoritarian illiberal side on the right without being too factional and you might say as Richard said I would say that wouldn't I but trying to stand back and I think there is a real problem of council culture by the way on the left I've always been hostile to no platform and we see it to a degree I'm with Bill Maher on this that side of liberal uh, approach and I hope our party gets it right on this but to answer your question um, it, it's yes it's true that the people who own newspapers are often on the right but nevertheless, it doesn't necessarily mean that you do lead to this right-wing populism in the editorial. Uh, you can look at the Washington Post, which has its faults, and Jeff Be Bezos has his faults, but you don't see as direct an influence or hardly an influence on their editorial that you see from the owners of the Murdoch Press and, and the Telegraph and so forth. Um, so, I think, so, so I think it is probably incurable, and the only answer is regulation and also just fight back the propaganda that it's a free press. It's not the free press, it's the free speech of those five tax shy billionaires and who control about 70% of our press in the UK. I draw you to a close, thank you. And Lucy is claiming her moment because you do get a moment. No, no it's okay, you, you just get your one, you get your minute like everybody else. Okay, so this is my okay. one minute on, on this particular topic, which is what I wanted to come back on just now was that who's paying is really, really important. Um, and, and one of the issues about what's, who's paying for the media now is that actually it's 
it's not really people buying a newspaper in the way that they used to and paying for the information. They're paying with their short attention span, very short attention span often, and the people who are paying are often the advertisers, um, or the very rich. And the very rich um, are paying not because they have the interests of the people buying the newspapers in, in mind, but they have their own interests in mind. And whether they're the very rich on the right or the very rich on the left, they have a massive interest in maintaining the status quo because they are the very rich. Um, and it doesn't really... So, so the fact that there is a huge problem with the payment for high quality journalism is, is uh, which is coming back to the next point, I think, is, is deeply, deeply connected to the fact that we don't get high quality journalism, that there isn't a mechanism in the system at the moment, other than um, the BBC, for example, and other kind of very heavily regulated areas, which tend to be supported by national governments for paying for valid media. Um, all the, the drivers are in the other direction. Um, and I'm in danger of getting into the next yes, section. Yeah, so I'll I was going to say, there. so stop there. Thank you. So everyone, thank you. That's the first topic finished. Thank you for sticking to time.